Hey, back here at the class, we're dealing in this book of Hebrews, and we come now to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. The author or leader of our salvation. Father, we thank you now as we come back together around the Word of God. Anoint us to speak these words. Anoint us to hear them. Not just be words we hear, but a revelation to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Verse 10, chapter 2, for it became him, that's Jesus, for whom all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For Jesus to become the captain of our salvation, he had to be made perfect through suffering. Now, that's a very difficult thought for us if we think it all. Why he, God made flesh, had to suffer to learn obedience. But when we understand how very intensely and really he took on our nature, he become absolutely what we are, tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, but yet he had to learn obedience just like we do because he become exactly what we are. Now, in suffering, his will was perfected. His character was fashioned. That's always the way it is. Now, his dependence on God and delight in the will of God was confirmed and made manifest through his life. His one statement over and over was, I come to do thy will, O God. At another time when the apostle brought him something to eat and he didn't want to eat, he said, I have meat that you don't know anything about. They hadn't learned this yet. And they wondered, but he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Now that, that see, that was confirmed and made manifest. In suffering, his obedience unto death opened up the living way in which alone the creatures like you and I can touch and know the Creator. Otherwise, we could not know Him except through that death of Christ. Now, the suffering, as a leader, the author of, or translated as the leader, he opened up a path of life, a mode of living and acting in which you and I are to follow. That's reading his character and his actions is God's word to us. You see, it's a creative thing. As we read the Gospels and we see him, his character, his actions, his works, then that is how God speaks to us in his Son. It's not abstract. It's a living word. And Jesus said, you can search these scriptures and believe you have life. But unless you find me who is life there, then you don't have any life. And so as we see this, we come to know it is only in suffering, being crucified and dead with Christ, that we know Christ in salvation, that, or is salvation. Only then do we know that. As we die to what we are, then the realization of his salvation comes to us because he is is, is is salvation. He doesn't just give us salvation. He is redemption. Paul said he's sanctification, righteousness, redemption. He's wisdom. All of this is us. When James said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. Christ says, I am that wisdom. You know, if you read the book of Proverbs, never where it has the word wisdom, put Jesus in there, and you'll understand that book a thousand times more than you'd understand it otherwise. He is the wisdom, the sanctification, the righteousness of God. And so we only know him in salvation through his death. Through our being coming dead to what we are, we become alive to what he is. Now, Christ was made perfect through suffering, that we, by being conformed to him, partaking of his spirit, find the only path there is to glory. The work of a leader supposes three things. Now, if you've ever been in that position of a leader, your pastor, what you own a job, you're, 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 you're the leader of, of, you know it always supposes three things. First, that leader must himself lead the way. If he's a true leader, 
This world hates a leader today. They want those that have to have a public opinion before they ever make a decision. Amen. They hate anybody that will make a decision. That, that You'll find that vehemently everywhere. Just can't stand a man that has an opinion to live by. But the first he himself must lead the way, passing through all difficulties, all dangers, knowing and showing it to those who follow. That, that, is, that is the only way. It isn't a man standing here pointing and saying, now you go that way and turn left. He follow him in all of this. But the second thing about a leader, those who follow must yield themselves wholly to his guidance. If you're not going to do that, then you're not going to get where he's going. If you will not yield to him who is the author and leader of this salvation, now he went before you. You understand Christ faced every difficulty you'll ever face. He didn't just point you away. He left the way. Now, if you are going to follow, you must yield implicitly to his guidance, walking as he walked. That, that's a testimony of this gospel. Third, the leader must take charge of his followers. Oh, my, this is an unbridled age we live in. They don't want anybody to tell them what to do, but if you don't, you don't have to. Somebody said, you don't have to talk in tongues. I said, of course not. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's all he is to that. My dentist says, you don't have to floss all your teeth. Just floss the ones you want to keep. <laughs> No, you don't have to follow. Follow yourself. I can tell you where to lead you. But the leader must lead. He must take charge of his followers, seeing that all hindrances are removed and providing for all their needs. He must deal with whatever hinders you in any way all the time. So the leader must walk in the very path his followers have to go. That, that can't be otherwise. Now, we've saw that tried. We've watched it. We've watched politicians that they believe to say a thing is the same thing that's doing it. So a man comes along, wants to do it. Then they say, can't do it, won't do, never do, don't do nothing. And, you know, it's always that way. But the, but the, the leader must walk in the path that those followers must go. The path we sought in vain was the one that could bring us out from under the dominion of sin. There was no possible way out of the state of sin and guilt but by submission to the judgment of God and entire surrender to that will. There is no other way out. A partial, a partial surrender will never, never find the answer. God spoke to Abraham when he was 75 years old. The command was, get out of your country, away from your kindred, he told him, and I'll show you a country. Well, he partially obeyed. He left the country, but he took his dad and his nephew with him. So he parked on the outside of the... God never let him get into the country at all until the daddy died. Then he got in, but he never was able to know what he had until he separated himself from Lot. When he completely fulfilled the will of God and command of God, Lot chose the watered plains of Jordan. Then God said, you climb up on top of a hill and everything you see belongs to you. But it never belonged to him till he fulfilled the will of God. You're halfway in. Well, I'll do this and I'll do that. No, you get in. You do what he tells you and you'll find the perfect will of God fulfilled in your life. church is full of people, and, and their conviction of their faith is a smorgasbord. They just pick and choose what they want. But God said to them when they slayed that lamb that is a type of Jesus, said, you eat that lamb, pertinence and all. You know what that pertinence is? That's the guts. You don't just eat the lamb chop. Don't eat in this thing what you like. He suffered, you'll suffer. If you follow him, the same thing's going to be true of all of us. But this is the way to the will of God and the perfection and completeness of this great salvation. You know, I know I talk Spanish to some when I talk about a complete salvation. We thought it was complete when we was born again. But to be complete 
when we're there with him at the throne of God. Now we're being saved all the while. But he that begun a work will finish that work if I walk with him in the way that he wants us to walk. Amen. <clears throat> now, this a leader must be followed all the time. He must, he must, his followers must walk in the path he walks. Jesus came. Listen. Jesus came and showed us that. Christ was perfected from his birth. Every wish, every desire was as it should be, but only as a disposition. Now, you, you, you may never look at this. You see, there was no way to come out of the fallen nature but by dying to it. Now, that, that I want to uh, restate that. Now, Christ was perfect from his birth, but, the, but he was only a disposition. Every wish, every desire of his heart was exactly as it should be. His whole testimony, I come to do the will of my Father entirely. His perfection was a power that needed to be tested and developed by trial. Is that right? All the way through, that's how he learned it, by suffering. It was something that needed to be tested and developed by trial. What the suffering and death affected in Christ personally in perfecting his character is the ground of work of what was effected on my behalf. It worked with him. God said it worked with you. He is the firstborn of the race. And if you're going to get there, you will follow this path. Well, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Well, it is like this. And if you want to awaken that likeness, that's the way it'll have to be. I know the secret sensitive deal we've got today. I, I know it. I, you, you may buy into all of it, but you'll find it's a dead end road, folks. I can tell you, he suffered and learned obedience with the things he suffered. And you're going to learn it the same way. There's going to be decisions that cost you everything. And if you're not willing to make them, you're not going anywhere. But you will not point a finger at God when it's over with because he has laid out a pathway to this glory, to the throne of God that has to be followed. I said that has to be followed. The perfection that comes through suffering is meekness, gentleness, patience, and a perfect resignation to the will of God. That is, I said, that is the perfection that comes out. When I come to know my impotence and know his omnipotence through the suffering that we're looking at here today. Now, because of the humility, meekness, lowliness of heart, which the Lamb of God showed on this earth, he is now the Lamb on the throne. Amen. Because of that, he is now the lamb on the throne. So a leader must be followed. Christ is the author of, or some, you know, the word can be translated also the leader of our salvation. His followers then must walk in the very path which he walks. There, there is no other pathway. That's not bigotry. That's the word of God. Now, Jesus came was made like me, took upon himself the form of a man. We must now come and be made like him. He took on my nature that I might take on his. He came to this earth and became like me that I might in turn become like him. That's the process and completion of the salvation. His suffering and death is not only substitution and atonement. It calls for fellowship and conformity that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering that perfected him. Let me in the fellowship of that suffering being conformed to his death. That's the only way we overcome and be like him. If we can understand it, we take those things as isolated. That's a reason a long time ago God dealt with me about just textual preaching. If you're going to preach, you've got to take in a lot of the landscape. Amen. You, you, you can take little incidents out of the Bible and prove anything you want. It, it said in one place that Judas Iscariot went and hanged himself. And you read on further, have nothing to do with that, says go and do likewise. Now, if you just cook the two together and leave all, the, you'd have all of us hanging ourselves. Hmm. 
Now, the substitution rests on identification. Out of that conformity comes growth and strength. Only out of it, as I'm changed into his image, comes the growth and the strength. Now, the Lamb of God has no salvation, no perfection to give but his own meek spirit of entire dependence upon God. Nothing. That's a humility. See, here's where the flesh man dies, and here's where the flesh man quits religion. When it comes to this, when there is no pathway but the humiliation and dependence, total, absolute resignation to God, that's the only way it works, folks. That's where most of this proud flesh goes out. That's where they do away with the cross. That I heard a preacher, one of the big ones, say, you don't have to cling to any old rugged cross. No, you don't have to. You don't have to make Jesus your Lord. You can live how you want to. God made it that way. But if you're going to awaken his likeness, you will embrace that cross. Amen. Death to self and the world is the only path to glory that is open to us. He walked that way. And if you get there, you also will walk that path. Second, a leader cares for his followers. You know, when we moved to Russia to put this, uh, to, to put this school into function, when we ran into the church there, what they call the uh, unregistered church, the underground church that suffered through those 75 years. Now, the bishops of that church, many of them had, had, had the mentality uh, uh, of Stalin. They didn't care anything about the people, just their little system. You've seen churches like that. They don't care anything about the people, just their own self, their own little system of things. Stalin cared nothing about Russians. He killed 30 million of them, amen, in those years. He only cared about that system. But a follower cares, uh, I mean, a leader cares about the followers. He cares in leading us to glory. The Father has made Jesus the leader of our salvation, not just into the door, but all the way to that throne, all the way till we awaken his likeness. He's, he's made him that. That means that Jesus, oh, and this was a great truth. Uh, now, this kept me awake. Since he's the leader and God made him the leader to lead me to this great salvation, that means that Jesus now is responsible for me. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. I, I, I'm not responsible for myself. I follow him. I know I'll make it. God said he is responsible for me. The great need in one who follows a leader is a tender, teachable spirit. Don't fool with people that know everything. They, you can't teach them nothing. I've, I've, I've dealt with them. I said, you, you brother, you got it. You get on. Don't, don't deal with that. Amen. You know, I, I appreciate anybody. You and I are, are God's children. See, me and my friend, the we're great friends. We just met here, but we'd have been friends if we'd met in the world. We just liked each other. You know, we're people. But, you know, he and I belong to God, and the unity we have is a unity of life. See, he's Christ is in him, Christ in me. It's one-mindedness. So you can't divide that. He may disagree with me. I may disagree with him. But if he comes to me, I'd have great respect. If he comes to Pastor, I, I saw what you said a little different. Then we'd both say, now, one or both of us is wrong. We're not going to divide over this. See, there's no, no, no it, private interpretation. So one or both of us is wrong. And if I'm wrong, I can tell you, folks, I want to be made right. I have no grinds, nothing. I want to be right. I was teaching on television years ago in the 70s. Uh, me and old Roberts and Humbard uh, dominated this country by television. I was on pretty well every corner of it. And, it, it, you know, and I had a great friend in Springfield, a godly man, wrote me a letter. He always listened. Uh, and he wrote me a letter. He said, I'm so glad you're there with the true message of Pentecost. But he said, I heard you Sunday, and you were dealing in this area. Did you ever look at it this way? 
and he pointed up some scriptures. I found I was wrong. Oh, how grateful I was to that man of God. Amen. I got on there. I said, look, I, 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 I didn't see all of this now. And so I got it straight. But he also corrected me. He said, and also, Pastor, forgive me, but there's no such word as born. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've never used it again. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You've got to have a teachable spirit. That's all that God, all this leader asks of you. He don't want your efforts of holiness. He don't want you trying to be. He just wants you to have a tender, teachable spirit. And that means you hear, you do. You understand? He said those that hear and can't hear. That means they won't do. They heard the word said, but they wouldn't do. But it means you do. We have a leader who was made perfect in meekness and submission through suffering that he might lead me in the same path that brought him to that throne. It'll bring me to the same place if I'll follow the same path. But if religion figures out a different path, it's going to wind up in a different place altogether. But he walked it. He left it. Now, if we follow it, our leader is the son of God, the creator and upholder of all things. Not only the son of man, as the leader outside of us, see, as the son of man, he leads us from the outside, influences, influencing us by example and instruction, the son of man, but also the son of God who works in us by the spirit, both of them working in us to bring us to glory. He works outside as the son of man, teaching, instructing, but inside in our spirits, even as it was God who worked in him and perfected him, will he as God now work in me to perfect me if I'll just follow as he leads. Where he leads, I'll follow, is one of the great theological songs of our time. We don't sing it much anymore because we don't intend to do that as a church of most. We figured out a better way, but I can tell you it's leading to the wrong place, folks. Oh, that God would open our hearts. You can't improve upon what God does. Now, I know I can get a lot of people into a religious system called a church by just doing a lot of things. I, 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 can, I can pull in what that world wants. They'll come in here and hear it. But listen, I didn't answer to anything. That'll only produce an Ishmael, not an Isaac. Amen. For whom and through whom are all things. For whom are all things? God is the final cause of all that is. It exists with the one purpose of showing forth his glory. Everything that it is has this one purpose to show forth the glory of God. Every object in nature has its only reason for existence in this, that the wondrous goodness and power of God may shine through that. That was the whole object of the creation that God's glory and honor may shine through that. Above all, man was created, that God, whose nature is love, might through him demonstrate how freely and fully he would make him partaker of the riches of his grace. That love should work exactly the same in me as it works in him. If it's the love of God shed abroad in my heart, then... It should work the same in me. So God allows people to misuse you. You do good to people, and they turn on you like a serpent. You say, why? I found as a pastor, the people I did the most for were the people the quickest to turn on me. But God said, I let that happen, not to show you how mean they are, but to let you know what love is functioning. Do you still love them? It's my love. If you're ready to, to, to take vengeance, it's your love. There's still a lot of work to be done. Still a lot of work to be done. How good God is to take time to show me where I am. Amen. For whom all things, that is, them, that in them his glory and grace may be made known. Listen to this. Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, 
or thou didst, for thou didst create, did create all things, and because of thy will they were created. Everything. Through whom all things. God, I said, is the cause of everything. God is the end and aim of things because he's their beginning and their origin. All must return to him because all came from him and only exist through him. Now, there's no life, no goodness, no beauty which does not rise up in him again in every only fountain and source. Listen, there's one God, the Father of whom are all things and we in him. All goodness. God alone is good and all goodness proceeds from him. The apostle might have written, it became God to make the captive of our salvation perfect through suffering. He might, he, the apostle may have wrote, not without good reason does he introduce here the character in which God acted and perfected, the son as leader of our salvation, the character. When man sinned and fell from God, he lost the two truth on which his relationship to God stand. In that fall, he lost two. First, his holy allegiance to God, having all things for him, his total dependence on God, having all things through him. He lost that. Instead of these came the reign of self with its life for self and through self. He lost that allegiance to God and everything coming to him. His only source was God. But those were lost in the fall and, and, and there came the reign of self. Now everything for fallen man is not for God, it's for self. Everything. That's the reason he's totally depraved. I've said to people, I know some good people. They love their children. I said, I know, but it's all for themselves. Everything is for themselves. Nothing in it has to do with the glory of God. It was from this life of self, Jesus came to redeem me. Amen. It, this, from this, to bring us back to God, back to obedience. It is from this selfish life, living unto myself, that God came to redeem me. In doing this, he opened up the only way that leads to glory. You know, we're in India. We got 40 full-time schools, 40 full-time directors moving across that country every day. Lowly thousands of disciples we've put in those streets. It's phenomenal what's happening in that world of the Hindu. But you know, it is 85% Hindu, 15% Muslim, 3% Christian, 1 billion, 50 million souls. Think of that. 3% Christian, that takes in Roman Catholicism, Orthodox, anything called Christian. So you know there's less than 1% of it Christian. Yet you read all the time of somebody over there and millions were saved. You know, you always get the report, millions and millions have been saved. But you find no evidence of them over there. And the reason being is they preach a Jesus... They preach this Christ, but they do not tell that Hindu that you got to get rid of the other three billion gods. They, they don't tell them that there's one name under heaven. They preach him. Uh, well, the Hindu says, well, I've got three billion now. What's, why, why not three billion in one? And so Jesus is just added to the heap, and they're not really ever come to know God. You see, they can put you in jail. They threw me off a radio in 1972. I was coming out of Sri Lanka into India, and I was getting mail, not big baskets full, but a lot of mail, wanting to know more about this Jesus. The Pan American Broadcasting Company sold me the contract. They wrote me a letter and said, we're sorry, we have to take you off. The Hindu government refuses such a, such a message to be preached. You exclude every other God but that Jesus, and they won't allow you to be here. Well, they're still the same thing. They don't care if you say put Jesus in here. They worship everything that moves a breeze, folks. And you add Jesus, but that isn't where it is. I said, that isn't where it is. It is Christ and Christ alone. You can't worship self, live for self. You got to live for him. And when you live for him, he'll give you everything. When you come in this altar to pray, you don't have anything to offer to him but an empty possibility. 
Oh, a man said to me, he said, you know, I, I can really play this horn. If you save me, I'll play it for him. I said, he don't want your horn, he wants you. Amen. You may never play that horn, or you may play it better than you ever played it, but he wants you. All you've got to offer to him at this altar is an empty possibility. He will fill that if you'll give it to him. He will make you a temple where God will live if you'll offer to him his that. Just completely offer it to him to possess and to own. His holy, he lost that. It was from this life of self, Jesus redeemed me. In doing this, he opened the only way. He did this first by showing us in his life as a man how men ought to live for God and through God. And then by delivering us through his death from the dominion of sin and win us for the power of a heavenly life, he gave us his life now to live. It was in this character that Christ revealed and honored God in suffering. This, this, it, it is to win and bring us to know and love God in this character that Jesus is Savior. Total dependence upon God. Through, through his whole life, there's nothing that Jesus sought to impress more distinctly on his disciples than this. Number one, that he was his father's servant and messenger. Nothing. I have no will of my own. I have no words of my own. I do nothing of my own. What he impressed us was that he was totally his father's servant and messenger. That, that, see, now he is, he is preaching to us with that. You understand? That is how he speaks to us. I am to be a doulos, a bond servant, a slave. I am totally his servant and his messenger. He pointed that way. That's what God is saying to us. That's the word God speaks through his son to us. Amen. Second, now the first he said, this is the, through his whole life, this is what he impressed upon us. First, that and he was his father's servant and messenger. Second, that there was no thought of doing his own will or seeking his own honor. I have no will of my own. I have no honor. He made himself of no reputation. He had nothing to seek for but God. But third, that he only sought and did that which would be for his Father's pleasure and glory. Now, when I come to that with him, that I do only that which pleases him, I will find that whatever I ask he'll do. John said, whatever we ask of him, we receive. Now, a man that can make that statement in truth as the Apostle John makes Bill Gates a poor man. Oh, yes. With all of his billions, he's a pauper compared to the man that says, whatever I ask of God, I receive from God. But John didn't stop there. If he had, I'd have called him up. I'd have said, how's that work, John? We do those things always that please him. I don't consider my life I consider him, but he's responsible for getting me there and presenting me faultless before that Father. All through God. Listen, that is faith. That is faith. All through God. Think about that. Think about that. This was a spirit in which Christ presented himself to God. Consecration and faith. Just give myself to God as that empty possibility. Do in me whatever you have to do. Mold me, make me after your will. I'm just here waiting, yielded and still. I think the second verse of that says, Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. The great revelation I recognize I cannot, that everything must be for God, but then I must recognize all is through God. Hallelujah. No matter what he tells me to do. He's told me to go do certain things. Oh, that's, I, I, I didn't want to do that. But all for God, all through God, and it worked out wonderfully. I had a young couple. They loved each other, but they weren't friends. You know, you, you can love, never be friends. You ever saw people like that? You know, you got to be friends too. They, they, they fought. I'd, I'd help them. I'd prayed for them. 
2 o'clock in the morning. They called me. Oh, my. I'm on the way over. I'm tired. I said, Lord, I'm tired. Uh, uh, you know, just I don't know what to do with this. But he told me what to do. I got there. He threw, He had threw a jar of pickles through that television at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, it was a mess. She started hollering at me what he had done, him to me what she had done. I said, look, shut up, both of you. Sit down. I've got something to tell you. I said, you drove me crazy. I've been over here to put this thing together five times. I said, God told me to cast the devil out of this marriage. <laughs> I did. Not out of them, but out of that marriage. They're missionaries to Mexico. Great people. But see, I recognize all things by him. That's me. All things for him. I got to straighten that marriage up. But that night I realized, you've been struggling, you've been trying, but all things also through me. Do what I tell you and the marriage will be all right. Hallelujah. No matter what it is. No matter. Amen. This was God who perfected Christ. To know and honor God in this character of Christ is the secret of perfection. In that character of Christ, all things of God, all things for God, all things through God. To know and serve God in this character is the only way it will work. It's a secret of power. It's a secret of living to reveal this God in his claims, to show how to give everything to him. This is what Christ came for. That's the reason he speaks through me in him. I watch him. He did nothing of himself. Everything he did was of God, was for God, was through God. So that message comes through him to me. If you will walk and live in this character, this is the life he brought us, the path he opened, the salvation he gives. And if you want the fullness of it, let's stand and worship him for a minute here this morning.